God's word for our meditation comes from our gospel reading. I'll reread a couple verses again. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is God's word. The disciples were in a state of panic and disbelief. On Maundy Thursday, the disciples were sitting at a table with Jesus, enjoying what was going to be their very last meal with him on this earth before he died. And they didn't know what they were going to do. For the past three years, they followed Jesus throughout his ministry, watching him preach, teach, perform miracles, and they tried to glean everything they could about the kingdom of God, what it was like and what was in store for them in the future. And as they tried to ignore the fact that Jesus kept telling them the plan of the Father, that he would have to go to the cross and die for the sake of the world, Jesus drops another spoiler alert, another truth bomb on them to add to their troubles. One of the disciples was going to betray Jesus. Because unbeknownst to the other 11, Judas was planning on betraying Jesus that very same night for some money. And his heart and his mind were already made up. It was going to happen. To make matters even worse, to throw throw more trouble on them, Jesus says to Peter, you're going to deny knowing me three times later this evening. So the disciples are in this state of panic and disbelief. The, the, The 11 of them are crumbling in front of Jesus' very own eyes. And then Jesus just says to them plainly, do not let your hearts be troubled. The followers who gave their lives to the ministry could not have been more earthly focused, here and now focused, but Jesus was so focused on eternal things, things that were going to happen in the future because he was going to save the kingdom the very next day. So in the midst of all of that pandemonium, all of the trouble that was filling the hearts of the disciples to the point of overflowing, Jesus gives them this comfort. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So as Jesus stood in front of, at this point, 11 of the most terrified people in the world, he reveals to them what is most important for them in that moment while their lives are flipping upside down, and that's their faith. Because those disciples, they believed in God. Their faith in God is what caused them to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah who was going to come and save the world from sin. The Holy Spirit strengthened their faith in that Messiah every time they heard Jesus preach and teach. They saw Jesus perform miracles that go beyond our understanding and go beyond the laws of nature. That strengthened their faith. They were even given the ability to perform miracles and heal people. And because they believed in God, there's no reason that they had to have troubled hearts or to fear that the plan that Jesus was following was going to work out. This was the plan of the Father. It was all going to be okay because he was going to save the world from hell. Because that very next day, Jesus was going to die on the cross for the sins that the disciples committed, that you and I committed, and that the whole world committed. But they had their doubts. They had their doubts that Jesus' death was necessary for the advancement of the kingdom of God because what king has to die in order for victory to happen? Everything that they knew by faith was being tested and challenged as Jesus' life was coming to a close. Thomas doubted the place where Jesus was going because why would the kingdom of God involve death and sacrifice? Philip just wanted to see the Father so that he could know without a shadow of a doubt that what Jesus was doing was for the best. And while what was going to happen to Jesus from the perspective of the the disciples was going to be very tragic, Jesus knew that this was the necessary path to glory. Glory that would open the gate to heaven for all who believe in him because Jesus is the only way to heaven. Have you ever read a a book before? 
and not just the Bible, but any old book, and you're in the middle, and things are getting very tense, things are get, you're full of anticipation, what's going to happen at the end? And as you're reading, have you ever had the temptation to open up to like the last three pages so that you know how it's all going to end, or is that just me? Because when you're reading and you're full of that anticipation, you want to know, how is this going to work out? How is it going to be resolved in the end? Have you ever spoiled a book or maybe even a movie like that for yourself? Because while, yes, it reveals the end to you, sometimes it makes the rest of it more enjoyable because you know how it's all going to work out in the end. And I imagine that you and I today, we're, we're in the middle of the book in our lives. And, and every day, we flip one page, and another day in our lives, and we're working our way to the end. And every day is full of ups and downs in our life. And our hearts are troubled, and they're anxious, just like the disciples. We keep flipping one page after another. And then one piece of troubling news after the other happens, and our lives go up and down, and maybe we lose the end goal. What's going to happen on the last page? And maybe you see yourself in Thomas, who said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? We have so many directions ahead of us in life, so many different paths to choose from. It's like buying one of those choose-your-own-adventure books where you flip to a different page depending on how you want the story to go. And maybe we think, if I take this path, will it still lead back to God? If I take this path over here, does that work out for my eternal good? And we have these decisions in front of us. And maybe when the world throws sin at us and troubles at us, it's hard to know when things line up with the will and kingdom of God or not. And maybe we lose sight of Jesus and the end goal when those troubles come in our lives. And it's so hard to find the right path because if so many religions claim to believe in the same God, who's to say which one's right? If so many directions lead to God then does it matter which one you choose? How do we know that there is a right way to the forgiveness won by Jesus on the cross if this is the most inclusive message in the world and it applies to everybody? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, while the gospel is the most inclusive message in the world because it applies to all, it is also the most exclusive because it is found in one person. Jesus says... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The forgiveness that Jesus won on the cross is for all, but there is only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. There is no other way by which we can be saved, Peter told us in our other reading. There is no good work. There's no other path, there's no other mediator, there's no back door to your room in heaven. There is one way, and it's Jesus. And if anyone claims to be on the path of to heaven without Jesus, they could not be more lost if they tried. Or, or maybe you feel like Philip, who said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Because it's one thing, to, to hear about everything Jesus did and said in the Gospels, to see how he touched the world with his love, with his grace. But wouldn't it be just a little more reassuring if we opened up to the book of Revelation we could see that with our own eyes for a second? If we could see the throne with the Father sitting on it, that we could see the multitude of angels, the new Jerusalem made of gold and the streets paved with pure sapphire, to see all of those saints who have gone before us into heaven, wouldn't it be nice if we just could see that for just a moment? Because if we could see the Father, then all of our troubles will melt away. Everything will be okay. And then we look right past Jesus as our true man, as our brother, as if he is not all we need to bring us that reassurance. Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus is all the evidence we need to know that what we believe and hear is real. Jesus, if he assures us 
that he is in the Father and the Father is in him, that is something we can count on. The, the, the Trinity is a marvel that we cannot even grasp with our human brains. But if Jesus says that the Father is in him, we know that it's true. But the fears of the disciples can so easily be our fears. And their doubts can so easily be our doubts too. This message of comfort that Jesus gave to his disciples happened before Easter to a group of men who didn't have much more time left with Jesus. We read this comfort today, thousands of years after Easter, to bring us that same comfort in our troubles, the comfort of the resurrection. Jesus comforted his disciples with this message and he comforts us today as well by dropping this spoiler alert, this is truth bomb on us, because Jesus opens all the way up to the end, the last pages of the book, the last pages of scripture, and reveals what is going to happen to us on judgment day. Jesus says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus paints this beautiful picture of what life is going to be like in heaven for us as believers. He opens up right to the end, reveals it, spoils it for us. This is going to happen in your future to bring us comfort as we are in the middle of the book of our lives right now. But every day, we still bear those sufferings. We still bear those troubles. And maybe many of us can say with a humble heart that we have had moments when doubt sometimes overshadows the glory that, that is to come. That glory of the finish line, that everything's going to work out and that we will be in heaven someday. Because to say that death for us has to come before eternal life happens is a scary thing to think about. But we have the comfort of Jesus in the word, in the sacraments, to assure us that everything is going to be okay. But we have those things, and then when the rubber hits the road, where do we turn? I hope we turn right back to the word and to the sacraments to bring us that comfort again and again and again. It is not a sign of weakness to go back to the word to find comfort. It is a sign of strength. Because as Jesus says, these words are the way they are the truth, and they are the life. We speak these words of comfort so often at funerals because it shows us comfort in our ultimate sorrow of life. It reminds us of glory beyond suffering and death here on this earth. It assures us that if we have Jesus, we know the way to heaven. And we know we have a room waiting for us there that Jesus is preparing for you. That room in heaven is just waiting for you. It is waiting for all who believe by a Savior who loved you so much that he died for your sins on the cross and he rose to assure you that because he lives, we too shall live. Amen. Please stand. <laughs>